of handouts with just a few points on just to sort of map out where we're going this morning. It's so brilliant to be with you this morning, looking at God's Word together. Just wonderful, wonderful things. Before we look at it, let's pray and ask for God's help. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you and praise you for your wonderful word. Lord, thank you for this amazing, amazing chapter. And Lord, we are not even sufficient to look at these things together. Yet thank you that it, it is before us. And we can gaze at the glory of Christ afresh. Please help us. Please open our eyes. Whatever we're distracted by or concerned about, please would he be our treasure this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Heinrich Heine, what a good name, is it? Heinrich Heine, a French thinker, back in uh, 1856, on his deathbed, muttered these words, God will forgive, that's his job. I wonder if that kind of sums up for us how our world kind of thinks about God. People think, I'm generally a nice person, or at least I try to be. I'm not that bad compared to others around me. Uh, and if I have committed some you know, minor sins, well, I'm sure God will forgive me. After all, isn't that his job? But while the world thinks that it's easy for God to forgive sin, actually, when we come to the Bible, the reality is but it is very hard for God to forgive sins. Just let that sink in for a moment. It is incredibly difficult for God to forgive a single one of our sins. Now, the reason I say that is because God is a holy and just God. Every sin committed is a sin committed against Him, against His majesty, His glory, His perfection. And therefore, that sin must be punished in the divine justice of God. God can't just kind of wave it away or ignore it or pretend it doesn't matter, because it does. He is a holy God, and to do so would be completely incompatible with who he is. So the question remains, how can a holy God ever let sinful people like me and you into his heaven. How? Well, wonderfully, we see the answer to that question in this passage. And if we zero in on the key verse, I think verse 6 is a brilliant one for us to start off with because it sort of sums up in a nutshell the essence of the good news of Christianity. Would you look at it with me? Have a look down at verse 6. Let me read it again. It says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that is Christ, the iniquity, the sin of us all. As I said, through this verse we are taken to the very essence, the heart of Christi the Christian faith. And it's remarkably simple. If you ever thought Christianity is difficult and complicated? It's very deep, yes. It's actually remarkably simple. Because this verse tells us two great truths. I think we've got them on the screen. The first one is that we are all sinners. Did you notice from verse 6? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The picture there is of a, we're like foolish sheep that so easily and quickly wander away from God, go our own way, and think we know better. We are all sinners, but wonderfully, in this verse, it also says we can all be saved. We can all be saved. Look at the second half of verse 6. It says, The Lord has laid on him, that is Christ, the iniquity, the sin of us all. You see, it is because of what the Lord has done through his son Jesus that means we can have hope. In fact, this is our only hope of forgiveness. Without this, we have nothing before a holy God. With this, with him, we have everything. This is the suffering servant. And that's why this talk is entitled The Suffering Servant. And I'd just love to spend a few minutes with you this morning just seeing how Isaiah presents him to us and, how, and what we're supposed to take away for our lives today. 
Firstly, let's take a step back and just get a kind of a broader view of how Isaiah 53 here fits into the rest of Isaiah. Three things, kind of beginning with M, hopefully on the screen. Um, the first thing is that Isaiah 53 is like a mountaintop in the Bible. So Isaiah, you may know, is kind of like a, 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 I was going to say a game of two halves. It's a book of two halves. Uh, chapters 1 to 39, largely about the judgment of God coming on his sinful people. Dark chapters. But then the second half of the book, chapters 40 to 66, in which our chapter lies, are chapters of hope and of promises that God is going to come and he's going to save his people from their sins and bring them home to heaven with him. And our passage today is like the mountaintop of Isaiah. Isaiah. Uh, because it explains to us exactly how this servant figure that we've been looking at in our series, Songs of the Servant, this, this is the fourth uh, servant song. This is the mountaintop because it tells us, explains to us how it is that the servant of God is going to save his people. And how is it presented? Well, he's going to do it through his suffering. His suffering. This chapter's importance in the Bible cannot be overstated. Um, by my count, and I'm not that great at counting, but I've done a bit, um, this passage alone, right, this passage, is quoted directly in the New Testament eight times. That's only a short, a short amount of verses, but eight times the writers of the New Testament say, let me quote Isaiah 53, because it's so key. And if you count up the kind of indirect allusions to this passage, that number rises from eight to 34. 34 times this passage is referred to. It's astonishing, isn't it? Have you heard that phrase, all roads lead to London? Kind of the arrogance of Londoners. But anyway, um, kind of all roads lead to Isaiah 53. It's that kind of central in our understanding of the gospel. It's a mountaintop. But secondly, it's messianic. Did you know these words were written over 700 years before Christ came and walked this earth. 700 years. What was 700 years from here? Uh, 13, 13 something. A lot of years. And you'd think, because it's written in the past, speaking of a future uh, saviour, that it would be written in the future tense. You know, He is coming. He will be like this. He will do this. But it's not. Did you notice it's written in the past tense? It's catches some people out. It's a little bit confusing, isn't it? But that's quite common in the Bible. It's called the prophetic past tense. And what's going on is it's describing future events that are so certain, because they're God's plan, so certain, that it's as if they've already happened, and he can look back on those events and examine those events. It's very much speaking of the coming Messiah. In fact, so clear it is that this passage is referring to Jesus Christ, that uh, you know, any reader without prejudice knows it's speaking of Jesus. In fact, so much so that I believe in some Jewish circles, this is kind of the forbidden chapter of the Bible. One uh, reliable writer said, in the past and even today, within synagogue reading systems, this chapter is mainly ignored. And you can kind of see why, can't you? So clear it is. Clearly speaking of Jesus. It's a mountaintop, it's messianic, but it's also massively powerful. This chapter has a powerful converting effect on all who encounter it. Do you remember um, uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8? Don't worry if you you don't know that story. But in that story, it was the Ethiopian eunuch was reading... This chapter, Isaiah 53, that we've just read this morning, he was reading in his chariot. He didn't understand who he was talking about. Philip comes. God sends Philip and says, let me explain it to you. And he, and he, he shows how it's talking about Jesus and his death on the cross. And that very day, the Ethiopian eunuch says, I want to become a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. And he says, you know, Remember, here is water. Uh, you know, what's to stop me being baptized? This would be a great chapter to take 
any sort of non-Christian friends to. And get them to read it and, and ask them, who do you think this is talking about? And then you can reveal that it was written over 700 years before Jesus even came. I think that, really, that story really pictures for us Isaiah's purpose in writing this chapter for us. It, he wrote it, I think, so that we might recognize the Redeemer when he came. That we might recognize him and understand him and receive him and so have salvation in his name. Now, let's look a little bit more detail at this wonderful suffering servant, how he's presented. I've got three headings for us. They're on your sheet. Firstly, the reality of his suffering. Secondly, the purpose of his suffering. And lastly, the vindication of his suffering. Firstly, the reality of his suffering. Would you look down with me at um, chapter 53, verses 2 and 3? It's a good place to, to capture this. I'll just read these verses again. For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Do you see the reality of his suffering? Firstly, he would be very fragile. Did you notice? Uh, Like a... Uh, a young plant, a, a root out of dry ground. Do you imagine a, you, know, this, you, know, you put a little seedling in the ground and, and, it, and it just kind of ah, out of the soil. It's so tender, so fragile. I think we put a bottle around it or something to, to protect it. Jesus was like that in a kind of amazing way. You see, he would, when he was born as a baby, he was fragile, wasn't he? When he grew up, he he knew what it meant to live in a broken world, full of pain, just just like we experience. He, too, would get worn out and hungry and tired, and he would weep. He was fragile. But secondly, he would be unimpressive to look at. Did you notice there was nothing... uh, about his outward appearance, that uh, it says he had no form or majesty that we should desire him. You know, amazing to think God's king was there on this earth, and yet he looked just like any other man. Isn't that incredible? It reminds me of the time, you know, uh, uh, Jesus went to uh, his hometown in the Gospels. Do you remember? He returned to his hometown. And, uh, and do, do you remember how they received him? Well, they didn't like him. They said, hang on a minute. Isn't this Jesus, the carpenter, son of Mary, brothers? We know his family. We know his sisters. They took offense at him. Such was God's king. He would be unimpressive to look at. And thirdly, did you notice in this little passage, he would be despised and rejected. As Isaiah sums up in those three sublime words about the Messiah, do you see verse 3? And what a description this is. He would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Just think about that. God could have sent a man of power that we would be awed. He could have sent a man of entertainment we'd be entertained. But he didn't. He sent a man of sorrows. So that everyone who is sorrowful in this life be drawn to him. Did you see also in verse 3 as uh, described as one from whom men hide their faces? I think it's quite an amazing description of... of, uh, It's basically saying I think people would be embarrassed if you were to mention his name in a, in a sort of civil, civilized dinner party, the, quick, the, the, the host would quickly try to usher the conversation on to something else. Usually politics. He wants to talk about. But you get the sense. 
he, he, it would be, it would be a, a taboo to mention him in the, in the office and in the office kitchen. He would be despised and rejected. And his death would come even though he was innocent of any crime. Just look with me at verse 9. It says, they made, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. So he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. This really reminds me of the scene, uh, do you remember when Jesus is, is before Pilate and uh, you know, he's, he's questioning him and, and Jesus, Jesus doesn't really answer his question. Um, and then the, before the crowd, you know, they're, they're, sh- they're shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Do you remember that scene? And, and Pilate says these words, why? What has he done? He's innocent. And so his death would come, even though he was completely innocent of any crime. The reality of his suffering. You know, do you ever wonder sometimes why uh, church is so unimpressive? And our ministries that we try and do are just so unimpressive, sort of cobbled together. Um, I wonder if it's because of the nature of the Saviour. He had no majesty that we would be impressed by his outward appearance. I think the problem is, and so faithful ministry done in his name kind of has the hallmarks of him, the man of sorrows. It's kind of unimpressive. So if you feel your, your vineyard table um, this past year was pretty unimpressive, or you know, you're leading a Sunday school class, and it's, or you're doing a one-to-one, it just all looks a bit ordinary. I want to encourage you that the Saviour looked very ordinary too, and yet he did amazing things. The trouble is, I think, we spend far too much time worrying and trying to look impressive to others, rather than simply thinking, well, the gospel is unimpressive, I'm just going to faithfully tell it. I'm going to pray that God would do the rest. And why would God's servant suffer so much? What would be the point of it all? Well, that leads us to our second point. Not just the reality of suffering, but the purpose of his suffering. Now we come to really just the heart of the heart of everything. Verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, that just means wounds. With his wounds, his stripes, we are healed. Did you notice the, the repeated idea of substitution in, this, in, in these verses? This idea that the suffering servant would die in the place of his people. He would take the punishment that they deserved for their sins so that they can be forgiven. Over and over again in this chapter, you can't miss it. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. Cast your eyes down to verse 12. At the end of verse 12, he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You can't miss it, can you? This suffering servant would suffer and die to pay the penalty that we deserve to pay if we trust in him. And where does that leave the believer who accepts this rescue, receives this saviour, this suffering servant? Well, verse 11 is the result. Look at verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Did you spot it? His sin-bearing death would not only take away the sins of all who trust in him, pay for it completely, but it would also provide for those believers who trust in him a robe of righteousness, Christ's righteousness, so that, as the song goes, with royal robes I don't deserve. So that when Christ, uh, when God looks at a believer, he sees, oh, he's wearing the, the robes of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. He's accounted righteous. You know, just to bed this in, I wonder what, how would you answer the question, why should God let you into heaven? Why should God let let you into heaven? You know, if, if we start to answer that question with the words, 
because I did, we're on the wrong planet. Because I did this, because I did that, because I did that. It's nothing to do with what you have done. or, or, or It's everything to do with what the Savior has done. So the only right way to answer that question, why should God let, let me into heaven, is because Jesus died for me. That's the only right answer. Because the suffering servant suffered for me. Was his death a tragic accident? Should it never have happened? Should the Roman, did the Romans and the religious leaders together just kind of overwhelm, overpower Christ? Not at all. Just look at verse 10. This, and this is a stunning verse. Verse 10, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him. He has put him to grief. You see, Far from being a tragic accident, this was the climax of God's salvation plan. To save his people through his son. It is amazing to think that at the moment of where, where Satan seems to have triumphed at the most, but getting the Son of God to be crucified was the moment of Satan's greatest defeat. as he pays for the sins of many. As on the cross, all the promises of God became yes in Christ. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. This is comforting, isn't it? Because, you know, we live in a world, particularly at the moment, that just seems wildly out of control. Do you feel that? And where evil seems to be triumphing at every turn. But then we look at the cross, and we realize these words, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And we think, well, if God can use that evil for his good purposes, then he can use any evil, even the evil in my life, for his good purposes too. It gives us confidence. But what would death, would death be the end of the suffering servant? Would that be it? Just fades away? Would he stay in the grave just like every other uh, historical figure? No, because this leads us to our last point today, the vindication of his suffering. And for this point, I just want to notice the, the sort of the top and the tail, the beginning and the end of the passage. Just notice the first one, at chapter 52, verse 13. God says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. And at the end, chapter 53, verse 12, uh, God says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. You see, the reward for Jesus willingly suffering and dying for the sins of his people, to undergo that, that his reward for that was to be exalted, to have glory and a name that is now above every name, as he rose from the dead, conquered the grave, and now is ascended in heaven at the right hand of God. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There is no one higher than Jesus today. You see, the one who came as a suffering servant in his first coming shall one day return in glory as a conquering king in his second coming. Are you ready? For the return of the king. Two quick applications for us before we finish. Our time is nearly up. The first one is, uh, this is kind of uh, basic, but the first one is, believe in him. Get that from chapter 53, verse 1. It says, who has believed what we, he has heard from us? You see, the message of this suffering servant would be rejected by many. Isaiah is there going, Who's believed our message? No one. No one seems to be believing it. That's still true, true today, isn't it? We feel like that. We try to share the gospel. How many people respond? We get one, we're so happy. Still true today. But the question still remains, have you believed in Jesus? In a room this size, maybe you're just looking into Christian things. You, you wouldn't say, I haven't quite reached that point yet. I'm looking into it. 
but maybe this is the day when you do. Ask yourself, could God have made his message any clearer than what you've read today? Could he have made it any clearer? Why delay any more? Think of the Ethiopian eunuch who said, see, here is some water. Let's get baptized. Could do it. But if you are already a believer, as I suspect most of us are, you're like, yes, 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 we're believers. Next point. But actually, I wonder for us if it's a bit more subtle than that. Let me ask you, as a Christian, do you consider yourself a servant of God? Yeah. Do you consider yourself to suffer for God's name? So are you the suffering servant? No. No. No, you're not. You see? Yes, we, we serve God. Yes, we suffer for his name. But we need to make sure we never trade places with the suffering servant. He's the one who first serves us. He's the one who suffered for us. He's the suffering servant not you. And that's hard, isn't it? Because sometimes as you Christian, after a few years, it does feel like that. I'm the suffering servant. Well, actually, you're not. Jesus is. So continue to trust in him, not yourself. Do you believe in Jesus? Or do you believe in yourselves? Lastly, believe in him. But secondly, and lastly, tell the nation. Just look at verse 52. Uh, 15, as we finish. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shut their mouths because of him. You see, this is such a glorious message. We can't, we can't keep this to ourselves, can we? We must tell the nations, spread the news abroad, high and low, rich and poor, young and old together. Let the nations uh, hear that Jesus saves. Well, let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, we... Thank you so much for this amazing, amazing chapter for our suffering servant, the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that even though we are all like sheep who have gone astray, yet you've sent your Son to be the suffering servant and you laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our Father, we pray that you'd help us to believe in him, not ourselves, and that we would tell the nations that Jesus saves. In his name we pray. Amen.